Our next author is Jack Churchward, and uh, he's written his second book with us. Now, a lot of you who have been in metaphysics for many, many years, the new ones are not going to know the name uh, James Churchward. The ones who have been into metaphysics a long time, do you recognize that name? James Churchward? He was the one in the 20s who wrote the first books about Mu. Now we know it now as Lemuria, but, and you argue about that, but uh, he, he called it Mu. And at that time, everybody thought he was crazy, but it was the first books ever written about the continent in the Pacific. Well, James Churchward is Jack's great-grandfather. <laughs> so the first book we published of Jack's, he was bringing back his great-grandfather's work because a lot of it's out of print, or other people are publishing it where they don't have the rights to do it. And he published, the first book was all the information and Jack did all the research and updates on it and footnotes. And that, what was, what was the name of that book? Lifting the Veil on the Lost Continent of Mu, Motherland of Men. And we have that book for sale here. His second book, he found a book that has never been published of his great-grandfather's work. So we're getting a lost information. And he's going to be talking about it. And can I just say, it, it's about the hidden cities in Mexico. And they've never been explored. Well, not for a tense long. You've been talking about all of that. I don't want to steal away from your lecture. <laughs> But I said, you got to put in the book where they are. People are going to want to go and find it. The city of Mexico City is built on top of it now. <laughs> anyway, this is information that has never been published before. <laughs> go dig it. <laughs> okay. James Churchward. Thank you. Thank you. That too much away from the my great-grandfather has had a, a lot of influence in, in our world, and one thing is, and I want to present it to you, uh, a video that the KLF did, uh, Bound for Moo Moo Land, and it will give more people an opportunity to get in here and, and see it. And
Well, first, I'd like to thank Julia and Dolores Cannon for having me back again. And uh, thank you all for attending and spending part of your Saturday morning with me. Today, I signed up to provide an uncensored look at what my research has revealed. We will be sticking to the abridged version due to time constraints, but not everything will be a rehash of old data. I've saved a few items for this occasion rather than reporting them on my blog or in a podcast, a small benefit. There will be fewer slides because I believe these words should not be window dressing to a distracting set of images. It is important to me that I communicate clearly and concisely so as to allow no misunderstanding. There may be points presented that you'd like to forget and points that create a demand for more information. Let me assure you of the veracity of anything. I'll stand by it and back it up in any discussion you wish to have. First, though, I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss James Churchward and his theories of the lost continent of Moo. This is my great-grandfather, James Churchward, who was born in Devonshire, England, in 1851. According to his books, James was on famine relief duty in India as a colonel in the Bengal Lancers, where he befriended a rishi of the local temple. After many months of learning the meanings of symbols on the wall, James was eventually shown some clay tablets by the Rishi. James called these the Nikal tablets and wrote that with the Rishi's help, he was able to decipher information about the now sunken ocean Pacific, Pacific Ocean continent of Mu. According to the tablets, Mu was the birthplace of humanity, or in his terms, the Garden of Eden. Mu had colonized the planet and was the wellspring from which all culture and civilization had sprung. The collapse of the Archeon gas belts caused the destruction of both Mu and Atlantis and raised the mountains some 12 to 14,000 years ago. James wrote The Lost Continent of Mu, Motherland of Men in 1926, Children of Mu and Lost Continent of Mu in 1931, The Sacred Symbols of Mu in 1933, Cosmic Forces of Mu in 1934, and the second book of the Cosmic Forces of Mu in 1935. My research is into the life and, of my great-grandfather and his theories. I think it helps if we understand the man behind the theories as well. So in, in interviews, I'm sometimes pressed to cite specific examples of what I've learned, but there's just so much to digest. For example, from a recent email conversation I had, I found out that Abraham Joseph Mansfield, in the 1970 book, Golden Goddess of Lemurians, stated that my great-grandfather, James, was chief of the gods of the Lemurians from 1874 to 1904. He had access to the plates of time, treasured in ancient sciences of God, and the advanced technologies of the atom bomb, ESP, electronics and science known to ancient advanced civilizations. Now, when they ask me for examples, uh, is this the kind of answer they expect? Uh, it's really always hard to know. But because I'm asked that question a lot, I thought that I ex should expound on that today. Let me step back further into my research and allow me to set the stage for how it all began. First, as a youth, when every time I asked my mother about my great-grandfather, she would say, speak to your father. <laughs> every time I spoke to my father, after someone asked me a question or whatever, he would say one of two things. First, it's all make-believe. Second, he interpreted a squiggly line that changed the meaning of the Bible. Well, to further describe my father's attitude to the subject, allow me the opportunity to relate a story that my mother told me after his passing. Back in the mid-50s, the local fashionable folks had found out that my father was James' grandson and lived year-round on Clearwater Beach, Florida. They had an obvious interest in the lost continent and James' theories and expected his grandson, Jack, to be witty, entertaining, and provide a keen insight into his words. So the mega-social event was scheduled for a Sunday afternoon. The setting was an enormous waterfront home on the Gulf of Mexico, with a lawn surrounded by a low stone wall. Guests arrived from miles away in their chauffeured rides and fancy dress to attend the event of the season. The food had all been catered. 
Lawn chairs and tables were set up across the lawn, and everyone was gleefully anticipating the guest of honor. After the appointed hour, my father, Princeton class of 1914, veteran of both world wars and member of the local yacht club, walked up wearing Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and his sandals. Of course, the initial impression was a letdown to the guests and, and the host, but they probably imagined that he was just a little eccentric. The introductions continued politely throughout the um, crowd, and eventually the obvious and eventual question was asked, so James, what are your thoughts concerning Colonel James? Those nearby quieted down to listen in rapt attention to the expected gem of wisdom about to be presented to them. When my father, true to form, announced in a loud and clear voice that he thought his grandfather's theories on a lost continent were so much hogwash and that he had made it all up. Needless to say, my father did not live up to their expectations and his words had a chilling effect on the assembly. <laughs> he soon left and they didn't invite him back. Until I went to the public library and looked him up, I never knew that James wrote books on the lost continent of Mu, but they never had copies of his books. And whenever I would ask the librarian, they would scrunch up their face and say, we don't have that book here. I never got to read the books as a kid, but because they weren't on the shelf at home and they weren't at the library. However, I did read quite a bit of science fiction. But after the US Navy and graduating college with an engineering degree, I was confronted with a challenge which put me in contact with many people of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Having a little bit of free time and also a very recognizable email address, I began to receive and answer emails about my great-grandfather with the same approach that I had learned from my father. From these emails, I noticed that my great-grandfather wrote about the Uyghur, the Mongols, and Tibetans, and, and now I was communicating with them on a regular, routine basis. Then I started to dig into my great-grandfather's past after receiving some old correspondence from a half-sister and determined that no wonder my great-grandmother, Mary, didn't like James. Even Jane's own mother excoriated him for his behavior when they lived in Sri Lanka in the 1870s. James had abandoned his wife and young son and sailed eastward across the Pacific to the U.S. and left them penniless. Mary stayed with my father's family for six months a year in later years, and some of her attitude must have rubbed off. I began to believe that they rejected it all just became it because it came out of his mouth or because he wrote it down. About this time, I also became acquainted with some certain observable, repeatable phenomena with absolutely no reasonable explanation. If I reach into a 400 degree oven, the pan is not going to make it to the counter unless I've got hot pads. Well, I watched somebody do it. And he made it to the countertop without hot pads or screaming. This person was an advanced Tibetan Buddhist yogi Please do not try this at home. <laughs> James did write about ancient advanced civilization with people with extraordinary powers. Just look at the stories James wrote about the Nikal adept who he met in India and identified as the Rishi. One specific story is mentioned in his 1931 lecture before the American Society of Psychical Research. It's called the Fiery Furnace. The Rishi was thoroughly familiar with our Bible much of the earlier part he knew by heart, particularly those chapters dealing with the cosmic sciences. One evening he said, I have been thinking, my son, about the great biblical miracle which relates that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked through the fiery furnace and were not touched by the fire. As I have told you, man has the power to raise his vibrations, the forces of his soul, above the vibrations of the earthly forces. Heat, which provoked provides fire is an earthly force. Therefore, man is able to raise his own vibrations above those of heat. So the heat force is repelled or nullified, forming a neutral zone through which heat cannot pass. The man's clothing partakes of his vibrations so that even his garments cannot be touched. Those who have obtained this knowledge which enables them to control these inner vibrations are termed masters. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were masters. It was by use of this method of raising vibrations that they were able to walk through the fire without injury. At this point in the lecture, 
James listens as the Rishi describes how they became masters and finishes up with a description of the practical demonstration. After finishing his discourse, the old Rishi looked at me and smiled and said, Now, I suppose I must as usual make all plain to you by giving you a physical example. And with that, he called to an attendant to bring him a large live coal. When the coal was brought in a chatty, he took my hand, deliberately picked up the red hot coal with his fingers and placed it in the palm of my hand. He then asked me if I felt any heat from the coal. No, I did not. He then told me to light my cigar from it. I tried, but the cigar would not light. He smiled and turned my hand over. The coal fell to the ground. He then withdrew his hand from mine and told me to pick the coal up. I innocently attempted to do so. <laughs> and although I dropped it hastily, my fingers carried burns and blisters for many days. He then picked up the coal himself, put it back in the chat. He said, now light the cigarette from it. I did so with no difficulty. The demonstration was complete. Another motivation to take a closer look were the discoveries in eastern Florida at the Windover Bog site. In 1982, a crew working on a new housing development covered an 8,000-year-old burial ground. Many of the bodies were so well preserved that archaeologists were able to recover brain tissue for DNA analysis. The remarkable thing to me wasn't that their DNA was unrelated to any Native American population, but they discovered a teenage boy with spina bifida, a crippling disease that probably required constant care and attention. These people were different. Instead of culling an obviously weak offspring whose life would be a constant drain on resources, he lived. These people had a buffer against the hardships of 8,000 years ago that allowed them extra time and resources instead of constantly fighting against the elements in their environment. This raises the question, could these peoples be refugees from an ancient advanced civilization that not, had not yet descended into savagery? The potential evidence of an advanced ancient civilization with the striking similarities between what I witnessed and James lectured about 70 years earlier, combined with my great-grandmother's obviously prejudicial attitude, indicated that maybe I should suspend judgment and take a rational and objective approach to answering the question I was asked instead of always being negative, especially since I had seen more than just one person reach into that oven. As the earlier challenges evolved into some life changes, I found myself with more time to pursue the research, the life, and theories of my great-grandfather. My online presence at my-move.com began in December 2005 with little fanfare and gradually increased since then. Now, please allow me the opportunity to explain my multidimensional multi research approach. On one level, I've been examining his books, but more on that later. One focus is to address instances where people take my great-grandfather's words and distort their meaning. One example is the late Verda C. Gostin, who proclaimed herself as the Empress of Mu, sovereign of North America, on the authority of my great-grandfather's works. The organization she headed sold driver's licenses, birth certificates, and citizenship in the Empire of Washita, and she proclaimed that you didn't have to pay taxes if you were a citizen in her empire. Unfortunately, the IRS will still arrest you. Just, just ask Wesley Snipes. James was clear on this subject. We are all children of Mu, and the rulers of the sunken continent of Mu no longer exist. Another focus is the artifacts that James shows and describes in his books. Since there are extraordinary claims made about some of them, that implies that extraordinary proofs are required and to deserve a full measure of scrutiny. Another avenue is created when today's news stories intersects with something James wrote about, such as Neanderthal and human interbreeding. James did not believe that the Cro-Magnon, the Peking man, or that Neanderthals were anything but human, as he wrote in his books. The current paradigm, that is, if I've read them correctly, is that today's humans are the result of interbreeding between three different hominids, one of which has yet to be identified. And James did say we didn't come from monkeys. 
Another push is through email. I get emails from time to time that provide information as well as those that ask questions. I solicit all questions in all emails and I try to answer them in a timely manner. Now much of this research is on my website, residing in the blog or on a podcast or in a static web page. But another part of the data is maintained on bits of paper and in emails waiting for the next tidbit to tip the scale. By itself it is notable, but when the right tidbit comes along, a new understanding will emerge. Today we'll go over some of the data and tidbits. Perhaps something will jog someone's memory and a new understanding will arise. One thing I've learned is that the story is never complete. There's always someone or something that can add more to our understanding. It's like a jigsaw puzzle when you don't know how many pieces there are. Although I'm descended from James, I inherited nothing from him except maybe his good looks. <laughs> I am indeed grateful to all those individuals over the years that have given clues and opened new avenues of investigation. Without them, I would not have the faintest idea about what I was doing or know where to head. One thing I learned about James was from the original typewritten biography done by Percy Tate Griffith in 1936 called My Friend Churchy. As a fisherman, if there were fish in the water, Churchy got them. This statement fits his bones for tunes also. He would mis mislead no young girl, not make passes at the wives or daughters of his friends, neither did he demean himself with women of the street or brothels. If one asks who and what were left, the answer is plenty. His success was remarkable. He was no ascetic. He found a cordial reception to his affection widely bestowed. Well, I found no evidence that James was a colonel in the Bengal Lancers. Despite claims that he was on a top secret military role in India, that I haven't found any of that. But in Ceylon, there were three church wards mentioned in newspaper articles from the time. One was Captain Charlie Churchward, a member of the 16th Lancers, and the last owner of the ancestral home of the church wards, Hill House in Devonshire. Another was also in the military, Major R.S. Churchward, of the Loyal Lancaster Regiment. The last is James Churchward, with many entries concerning his tea planting escapades starting from January 1872 until August 1881, when it is rumored that he has returned to the island by a recent mail steamer. In 2011, I was sent pictures of the Hatherley estate. Uh, showing the grounds and the buildings where James lived so long ago. The scenery is absolutely impressive, especially with the waterfalls and the dense tropical vegetation. James' accommodations are still standing and function as a guest house today, while tea production still continues. Another thing that I learned from email con correspondence was in, 19, in 2007. A lady had written to me to say that a relative had passed away and that she had known the colonel. James had provided her with a few metal artifacts as being from Mu. One of them is shown in the 1931 Lost Continent of Mu and identified as being 12,500 years old. The artifacts were shown to the British Museum and evaluated as being from the late 18th to early 19th century from India, but they were not able to describe, to, to decipher the inscription other than to say that it was probably the owner's name. Well, it wasn't until 2012 that the late Alexander Voronin, president of the Russian Society on Studying of Problems of Atlantis, wrote to me that said that a colleague, Willie Melnikoff, had translated the inscription to read, Master Nedge did for all in the Gujarati language. Another thing I learned was that James never divorced Mary. Yet he lived with another woman and her sisters for many years. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> her nephew was Howard Kerasy, and James treated him like a son. I have seen on the internet that the copyrights were renewed in my father's name, which is, always my, which is also my name. But it wasn't until I obtained some correspondence that James had saved that a few more dots were connected. One letter was from Eves Washburn, Washburn in 1995, 1955, sorry. Let me, to let me know that he had control of the rights to James' books and that average sales for the sacred symbols of Mu was 400 a year. 
Children of Mu was 500 a year, and the lost continent of Mu was 1,000 a year. And all of them had a price for $3.95. I then came across a 1982 letter from the late Joan Griffith to Howard asking about Jane's relative, and the reply mentioned that he didn't know of any. Well, I met Joan in the 1990s, and she mentioned the letter to Mr. Kerasey and his response, and I thought nothing of it until I opened the box a few years ago and saw it. At our 1990s meeting, I updated her on what I knew about my genealogy, as I had a copy of the newly published Books of the Golden Age, and she had a copy of James' original typewritten biography from, written by her father. We, we exchanged books. When I first met Joan, I had not developed my tolerant attitude toward my great-grandfather. And I'm sure that subsequent communications were colored by her first impression. But inside the box with the letter was also a newspaper clipping of James Alexander's church ward's obituary. James' son, born in Sri Lanka in 1872, and my grandfather. Not only did Howard keep the obituary after James cliffed it, he also kept James' secret safe when asked. Also in the same box were some official correspondence from the Mexican government about William Niven's tablets. That is covered in my new book, The Stone Tablets of Moo. But the official was very interested in finding out more information, and he was very, very impatient. The last three letters from James to Howard, and each was signed uncle, were also in the box. James arrived in Los Angeles and books roomed for three months at the Hotel Chelsea in mid-December 1935. He mentions that he is slowly recovering, but feels well enough to send for his fishing tackle and the possibility of starting to lecture in January. His letter also includes that he had three invitations to Christmas dinner. The last letter is dated just eight days before his death and is very upbeat and optimistic. I do have a copy of Howard Kerasey's telegram to my father informing him of James' funeral arrangements, but this one came from the church ward side of the family. James was well aware of, my, of James' relatives even in 1936 when James passed. Within the past few years, a German magazine article announced the rediscovery of the Nikal tablets in India. According to my great-grandfather's works, the learned persons of Mu, known as the Nikal Brotherhood, copied the collective wisdom and knowledge on tablets which became the Nikal tablets. James wrote that he saw a few in India and translated them with the help, help of the Rishi. Mr. Ritter, the article's author, a travel guide with trips to India, didn't include pictures in his article to back up his extraordinary claims. I was able to finally speak with Mr. Ritter, and he eventually sent me images that he claimed represented those Nikal tablets. I posted the pictures, and the response was overwhelmingly negative. Some pictures showed a script instead of the symbols that James wrote about, and a large metallic plate is actually on display in a Beirut limit on museum. As representative of the second millennium proto biblian script, the magazine article was a hoax. Uh, let me repeat that. The magazine article was a hoax. Now, it is a well-known accusation that James was the only Westerner to ever have seen the Nikal tablets, and he provided no documentation to back up their existence. Other than including some symbols and their meanings in his books, there are no pictures or drawings of them. I would like to add a bit more to this discussion with something from James' scrapbooks. Quite a bit of the data in the scrapbooks is related to his theories and may be found in his written works. However, there are some things that James didn't include in his books. There are three newspaper clippings from November 1924 and January 1925 that refer to 125 tablets found in India and translated by Lieutenant Colonel James Churchward and unnamed, excuse me, unnamed Buddhist scholars. The tablets describing Yu Mu use the same terms and phrases as James uses in his subsequent works. Immediately after this presentation, a posting will be released to, actually there are three postings, on the, will be released to the my-mu.com blog showing the image of the newspaper articles and a transcript. I will not be posting it to social media for at least a week to provide an exclusive view for all of you. 
I will also admit that the idea of an enormous mid-Pacific Ocean continent is not very plausible given the geology of the Pacific Ocean floor. However, another consider must, consideration must be factored in. James wrote that the idea of a continent also came from Polynesian legends. Given the long distance between different islands and island chains, could a nation of connected peoples who knew the waters intimately and not consider their territory to be a cohesive whole? Not a defense, just, just a thought. Another thing I learned from the lady who had received those metal metallic pots was that James told her that he had two daughters and he provided pictures. This is actually a big deal because if it were true, there could be copies of James' unpublished manuscripts stored away in the attic of their descendants. Does anybody recognize these people? <laughs> now, if you think this is far-fetched, here's the cover of one such manuscript that has been uncovered. This is the first public display of this image. I'm working on the details of making the entire work available to the public. So if you recognize the pictures of those two young ladies, See if there are any old boxes laying up in the attic that might contain unpublished manuscripts. <laughs> As mentioned earlier, I've also been researching the contents of James' works. But first, let me provide a hint of the title of the works. Please don't pick a long name to add to another long name. It's just really hard to write down every time. Now, I had originally thought to use Digging Up the Lost Continent of Mu, Motherland of Men, but then I thought, when I got to the children of Mu, how, would people understand digging up the children of Mu? <laughs> Probably not. So my approach to my first book, Lifting the Veil on the Lost Continent of Mu, Motherland of Men, was simple. Save the personal part of James' life for a future biography. The researcher analysis and analysis would consist of examining the references James used, the books and authors he quoted. Depending upon the available information, the original text from books he quoted was reproduced after James' text in a new appendix that was listed and quoted all the books he referenced. Likewise, a short biography was created for each of the authors so that the readers knew or could at least have a guess on the validity of what they wrote. Did they have the life experience necessary to form rational opinions or had they been venturing into fantasy land? I also combed the text to find references to other theories or statements. One of the sources used were copies of James scrapbooks that I had obtained indirectly from the estate of Howard Kerasy. Although many of the articles were unreferenced, in the text I was able to piece together quite a few references that were included in the text. And I included them as footnotes in the end of each chapter. Some of these footnotes were transcribed text over a page or two long. I do find it helpful to include primary resources as appendices, when and where they might be difficult to obtain. It also makes it easier to answer questions you may have so that you don't have to run to the bookshelf or go to the bookstore and get another copy. For the second book, Copies of Stone Tablets, found by William Niven at Santiago Ajuizuecla near Mexico City, a different approach was necessary. James probably expected that nearly everyone reading the work would, need to be would be already familiar with the lost continent of Mu, motherland of men, and did not feel the need to go over very much old ground. That eliminated investigating authors and quoted works as a means of analysis. Obviously, a background for the reader was necessary, unless I wanted to just sell the books to people that had read the lost continent of Mu. So there is a narrative describing the who's and the what's, why's and where's of the book, written by James Churchward, for Christmas 1927 for his publisher, Edwin Rudge. Most of this special batch of Niven's tablets was subsequently used in James' books, and nine are represented for the, reproduced for the first time. Images from the original are shown against future appearances, as well as James' interpretations. In addition to the transcribed original document and cleaned up images, a complete chapter from The Lost Continent of Mu, Motherland of Men, covering Niven's buried cities, and some items from James' scrapbooks are contained as appendices. Included are, included are a copy of the original article that became the edited version of Niven's Buried Cities chapter. And, and also I included some of James' writing that further define his theories on Central American history. 
for those of you participating in the workshop that I'll be holding on Monday. I will have all the footnotes in PDF format available, including in some cases the completely referenced article. Of course, I'm going to uh, recognize the copyright restrictions. But the final thought I'd like to leave you with is the underlying message from my great-grandfather's works. It isn't whether or not there are sunken continents or advanced ancient civilizations. It isn't whether or not we can regain forgotten ancient technologies and fly around the planet. James' premise was that we're all humans. Through thousands of years of cooperation and harmonious interaction, we're able to create an advanced civilization. Also, he stated that all humans have a common ancestor, which implies we're all related. Since that last point seems to agree with science, James was right on his most important point. If everyone had a realization of our shared human existence or remembered that we were all still related, our world would be a better place. On this point, I agree with James. If every human understand our shared existence and learn to get along, I have no doubts that we could advance to a higher civilization than the one we now enjoy. I'm prepared to ask, answer any questions that, that you may have at this time. Do you have any s pictures of some of the little, uh, the little figures that you have in the book? Do you have any that you could put up there? Negative. You didn't bring any with you? Uh, those I've saved for the workshop. Oh, for the workshop, okay. <laughs> and the, 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 cover, the cover actually contains, if you look closely, and hopefully I'll put the right button on here. Right here, you can see that Here's, the symbols are, are, have been placed into this big tablet. So if you get a, a, a glimpse of the cover, there's some of the tablets there. But they also have all those little figures. Correct. That uh, nobody has been able to identify, and they're all lost. Nobody even knows where they went. That's correct. And he, I think it's interesting that the cities are there, and they've never been dug up. Well, it'd be a, quite an effort to dig them up. But now Mexico City is on top of it, so how are you going to find them? But the book is interesting because it does talk about where it was located and how they did, it, they did go and find it way back. Was it in the 1900s? Well, actually, uh, the Niven? Niven started finding, moved to Mexico City in 1911 and started to dig he had an agreement with the Mexican government to, and that enabled him to keep some of the artifacts. The best of each of them were provided to the National Museum. But it wasn't until 1921 that he started to find the, what are, what are now called his, uh, the stone tablets of what are covered in the stone tablets of Mu. So nobody ever really explored it. And what he found, he has pictures of them, but they've disappeared. So it's a mystery. to know if you had any pictures. <laughs> They're in the book. We tried so hard to get that book here on time, but it just, it came down to the wire. And it didn't arrive today, but we're taking um, orders on it and we will mail it to you in, when it comes in. It should be in my Monday anyway. Okay. Do we have any questions? Please clarify for me the relationship between Mu and Lemuria. I've heard they're the same, and I've heard they're different. Do we have enough time? Um, <laughs> of course. Actually, my great-grandfather never referred to the sunken continent in the Pacific as Lemuria. Lemuria was a concept brought up by some anthropologists who wanted to find out, or paleontologist who wanted to find out why there was a distribu distribution of lemurs around the Indian Ocean Basin. And that's originally how the name got there. Other people have taken that and run with it. The theosophists, there are many different organizations and individuals that have expounded upon Lemuria. Some people call Mu Lemuria, some people, and they believe that the terms are interchangeable. But a, my great-grandfather didn't channel 
Uh, he never got any of his, in, uh, anything he placed in his books did not come from channeling or anything like that. Like, for instance, some of the Lemurian histories are provided from individuals who say that they were there and that they channel the information and they write it down in a book and like the Phylos, the Tibetan, I'm not sure who wrote that book, but it describes Mu as well. But James never spoke about Lemuria as being Mu. He never spoke about, I'll turn that around. He never spoke about Mu being Lemuria. Yes, ma'am. Now the question was, did he make any reference to the fact that Atlantis was at the same time of Mu? Yes, James does, and I believe it was in one of these slides. James believed that every human on Earth came from Mu. And so his thought and idea was that Atlantis was a colony of Mu. He did not write that they got into a nuclear war with each other and wiped each other out. He believed it was the collapse of the Archeon gas belts that both sunk Mu, Atlantis, and raised the mountains. If you notice on this map, the little, oh, it's here somewhere. There's, I didn't color it in, but he believed that there was an inland sea here that enabled people to Trans, go from Mu straight to Atlantis and then on onward. Yes, ma'am. Well, actually. Uh, James never mentioned that in his books. He, the, the question was, did James write about the Buddhist scholars and the uh, translated tablets? Uh, actually, negative. Uh, those, was included, those were included in his scrapbook. That part of it never got to his books. In his books, he always talks about the Rishi that he had involved himself with and had, uh, sought instruction from. Um, in the center of Mexico City, there are places that the buildings are on top are coming down or important thing, sinking. And I was wondering if that is the Mu city that was built on Mexico City or how that got under. How I, I'm thinking on the people that they build their houses that they ever thought that was under there something. Mm -hmm. Most likely, there's quite a bit, obviously. The urbanization of Mexico City increased incredibly, and the population has soared. So there's, it's all covered by an urban jungle. Uh, William Niven, when he was digging, went down at sometimes over 30 feet to find three separate layers of human habitation. The, the bottom layer was covered by a volcano, followed by what appeared to be a flood, and then the some other boulders and sand that came in after were that. But yes, it's possible that there are still relics down there under people's houses, but I'm not sure you'd want to really dig up the foundation of your house or your backyard to go try to find them. It might fall in. Yes, ma'am. Who is covering a, or was covering a significant number of islands in the Pacific? Are there any vestiges in any way of Mu in their um, in their stories, in their uh, folklore? Are there any artifacts that ever have emerged, say, like like in Guam or, or Palau or any of those areas? Most of the artifacts and structures that have been discovered in the Polynesia and the and Pacific Ocean have been dated to at, at most 2,000, maybe 2,500 years ago. But prior, that does, they don't reach back to the 10,000 or 12,000 to 14,000 years that James wrote about. Now, the symbols that uh, were interpreted, are there links between those symbols and subsequent 
ancient symbols, uh, hieroglyphs, um, Babylonian, Assyrian, are there any similarities? Well, in, apart from James' interpretation of the, of the tablets, uh, the archaeologist John Cornyn wrote an article called Mexico's Mystery Writing in which he hypothesized that the symbols that James had found and that actually that William Niven had found and was using were part of the uh, glyphs, the Mayan glyphs that were at that time not understood or, or deciphered, but that have been subsequently. And he believed that they were placed in the proper order to represent words and whatnot in the temples of, of the time. I believe the Hawaiians have a lot to say about that. Yes, uh, I believe that one of the places of Mu is, is supposed to be the remnants of it. Uh, I was just wondering if your grandfather had any reference that the people of Mu were as advanced as the people of Atlantis. Atlantis, in my great-grandfather's writings, my he wrote that Atlantis was a colony of Mu. So I would say the opposite was true. Have there been any other countries where unexplained stone tablets have turned up that you know of? I, I recently found that the, uh, the monument, what they call the Yonaguni Monument off the coast of Okinawa, that the Professor Komura had found a tablet there. And I just found this out and I was um, shocked and amazed. I, I hadn't realized that perhaps another one of these uh, tablets have been discovered. But as far as any other tablets being found, uh, I'm not aware of it, but if somebody else is, please, please let me know. Um, hi, you'd reference the collapse of the gas belts that caused that. I'm not familiar with that. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit where that is or what that is. Or well, still James exists. believed that there were gas, uh, what he called the Archeon gas belts throughout the world. And there were belts of them that, that the volcanic action caused them to, uh, that magma filled them and it finally burst through to the surface. And that when it burst through the surface, the land collapsed, and in other places, the land raised to, to form the mountains. This is, I haven't found any references to James Archeon gas belts either, but I'd be more than happy to, to entertain any ideas that others have. Well, the Archeon gas belts, I mean, basically, you've got to sit. The gas belts, I mean, like I'm listening to, I mean, we can call it whatever we want, but I mean, if you look at the greenhouse effect now, and you've got all the tundras as the, as the ice melts in sort of Greenland and northern Alaska and so on and so forth. They're releasing so many gases, you're actually talking a greenhouse effect. So, I mean, the raising of water levels would, could be a direct link to that. Okay. We do have copies of the first, of James's first book, Jack's first book, that explains a lot of this. It has a lot of drawings and charts about what you're asking questions about. Yes, James devotes an entire <laughs> chapter to the, the geology of the collapse of Mu. And we have those here for sale that Jack will be shine, signing those. Do you want to tell them what parts remain around the circle there? What countries you think that he thought were still remnants of where Lemuria was? Well, actually, if, if you if you look at some of the Lemuria, the writings about Lemuria, they believe that the west coast of California is actually part of Mu. They believe that, according to one writer, uh, Jose Serve, that Lemuria zoomed across the Pacific Ocean and jammed itself into California, but part of it sunk and formed the mountains there in California and is a small strip along there. But that's, I believe, is, and James also wrote that the islands in the South Pacific, the volcanic islands, are the remnants of Mu. 
What about Australia and New Zealand? Um, James wrote that, I don't know whether he was upset with the Australian people, but <laughs> he, he wrote in his books that there was absolutely no colonization in, uh, from Mu to Australia, that, that nothing is there, is, is what he wrote. It would make sense, though, that it went down into Mexico. Just going straight over. Yeah. Same thing. I, 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 don't, I know that he went to New Zealand because he was very knowledgeable uh, about some of their uh, gems and whatnot. But I don't believe he specifically mentions New Zealand as, as being inhabited or colonized by the people of Mu. Absolutely. Uh, James shows in his books, in, in the Children of Mu, in 1931, Children of Mu, that the eastern and western lines of colonization, if I can briefly... What was her question? Oh, the question was, did James show eastern lines of colonization? So, essentially, he believed that one group went through this inland sea and colonized south, the southern portion of Atlantis and then eventually went on to Africa. And then there was another group that went to Europe from this direction, and also the Maya that stopped there. Now, James' interpretation of the Maya is different than perhaps we understand today. James' interpretation is more close to the Hindu, who believed that the Maya were an ancient people who were excellent navigators and a high civilization, and they, according to James, were the people that had left Mu and colonized everything. Now, if I could speak about the Western lines, James believed that there were essentially two lines that went. One were the people that became the Uyghur, the great Uyghur Empire in the middle of Asia. And the other line went down through, and, and it's not shown, but it went through Indonesia and, and finally ended up in Burma, from Burma to India, and India on to uh, Iraq and Iran. Yes, ma'am. But there's no link. You talked about the, the anomalous DNA they found. You showed the plaque. In, you showed the plaque uh, indicating uh, the... For the window, Windover Bog site, yes. Right. And, and the uh, anomalous DNA, I mean, they couldn't trace it to a particular source. I believe it was traced back to Europe. Was traced back to Europe. So there aren't any DNA trails at this point. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Most, a few years ago, they believed that all the DNA, they showed a tree that showed all the DNA came from Africa. And obviously everybody thinks about it as the out of Africa theory. I read just a, a month or two ago that the Russian scientists have come up with new genetic Im information that says all the people came from Asia or actually Central Asia. And I am, I'm going to wait till somebody else weighs in on that theory to be able to, to remark about it. Thank you. That's all the time we have. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.